And I, and I want to talk about the impact of all these coups on wages and our ability to have just wages. Now, in any, in any economy, right, in any economy which is, which is without political instability, without any fear, without entrepreneurs wondering if governments are going to change and contracts are going to change, there's a certain amount of income being produced, certain amount being spent by households, by, by firms, you know, by even by government as well. And a lot depends on future growth, on, in, on the amount of savings. The aggregate, this is a macroeconomic concept, not the normal household concept, although the household savings also go into it. The amount of savings in the economy as a proportion of GDP. It's accepted everywhere that if you're healthy economic growth, you've got to have about 25% of the GDP at least. Countries like Singapore used to have 40, 45 percent, you know, 20, 30 years ago. This graph over here shows you, you know, comparison between Mauritius, which is a small island country like ours, dependent on tourism, dependent on, on, on sugar, and also half the population are Kenya, just like Fiji. Right? And this is where the same level of the proportion of GDP was for Mauritius, way above 20 percent. And this is where it came for Fiji. And once it was higher than Mauritius, to private sector savings, but all kinds of just stuff that just keeps things trundling along without any great extra capacity being, being created. And the result of that, of course, is this gross capital formation, which crudely, crudely interpreted, if you like, is investment in the economy. It also includes uh, depreciation and all that. And, and that is a proportion of GDP. Again, you can see the difference between Mauritius, which is way, way up there, I believe. Now, if you have if you have this kinds of patterns, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what are all the factors that encourage investors to be confident enough in the future of a country to convert their valuable scarce savings into investment? Think about the spending and investment behavior of households, firms, and the government in a safe and secure economy, and think of the same in an economy where coups and extreme political conflict have become the norm. And think of all these businesses in Fiji, which for more than 22 years since the first 87 coup, they have been zipping these profits and savings out, safe from devaluation, safe from restrictions. And I suspect a whole lot of us families who have got children studying overseas and all their families overseas would have been doing that as well, just simply to look after the welfare of our own families. It's not an abnormal, it's not an abnormal behavior. And that is the real gross domestic product per capita in Mauritius and in Fiji. You see one. You can see Mauritius started off lower than Fiji. This is in uh, US, uh, US dollars, uh, real US dollars, so adjusted for inflation. It will be different from the previous graph we had, which was on in Fiji dollars. But you can see that Mauritius was below Fiji around about 1980 and all that. And they've had steady growth for the last 20, 27 years, 28, 29 years. They've more than, more than doubled their GDP per capita. Fiji has just barely kept pace. And, you know, while, you know, while, while, while military coups are not the only answer for our poor performance, we've also followed bad economic policies as well over the years. We have persistently refused to fix up our our land tenure system, which could release the labor of our people and, and, and encourage agriculture to grow. So it's still the same problem now. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you devalue this, that. Or, if you do not fix up the land tenure system in Fiji, the economy is not going to grow through agricultural production. Right? And there are other problems as well. But essentially, there is that graph, which is Fiji's gross domestic product in, uh, in, in 1995 price, in other words, adjusted for inflation. And that was the trend. This red line here. That was the trend for the, the 16 years before the first coup in Fiji, before 1987. And not particularly great growth either. It was only about 2.6%, 2.7%, which is moderate. You know, China has been growing at about 15% for 15 years. India, you know, similarly. You know, Malaysia, similarly. So for us to grow at 2.6% in a phenomenally rich country like Fiji, that has been an absolutely pathetic performance. But that wasn't enough for us. That wasn't enough for us. Every so many years, we've actually had to do a military coup. 
Somebody thinks they can take Fiji onto a path to Nirvana by using guns. And those black dots, those black dots, those are where we had our foot. because of this military coup. But you know, the patterns were set in 86, 87. They were set in 2000. Everybody thought you could do a coup, change the constitution, give yourself amnesty, and everything would be hunky-dory afterwards. Nothing seems to have changed. Now, the question I want to ask is, if we know all this, and this is not a new graph, some people would have seen it before, right? Why is it then so many good citizens have supported the military coups of 87, 2000, and 